if you do not understand white supremacy, what it is and how it works, everything else that you do understand will confuse you. In all of these nine areas of activity, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war, anywhere on the planet, minute by minute, day by day, all of the time, all of the time. Good morning and welcome to the December the 5th, 2023 edition of the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. I am your co-host, Mr. Bobby, and we thank you for tuning in to today's program. Now, let me start off by giving you some numbers because we would love for you to be a participant in today's show. And you can do that by calling this number, 516-453-9921. Now, when you contact that number, um, if you have something to say, press the number one button. And when the call screener comes on, give the call screener your name. And uh, you can, um, when I call you, then you can ask your questions and you will be heard. Now, if you do have a question, you may answer that. And if you have a comment, you may do that also. But be brief. I know that sometimes people get on here and uh, they give a long dissertation about something. I, I could feel their passion. But. Since we only have a two-hour window, you have to condense that into something small that Mr. Fuller can understand, I can understand, and the listening audience can understand. So make sure you do that. Now, if you are a first-time caller, do the same thing except this. Make sure that you tell the call screener that you are a first-time caller, and we will or something is set up for you so that you also can be heard. You can ask your question. You don't have to be afraid. If Even if you have to rehearse what you are going to say, write it down so that you can be concise and, and quick about that, and Mr. Fuller can uh, answer your question. Now, as you know, or most of you know, that Mr. Fuller uses examples extensively because it is important that we be clear, that you understand. So there's time that's going to be taken. You all know that who call in. He's going to do that. Various examples so that we have an understanding. Why? Because we want to eliminate confusion. So remember that. Now, you can also Gmail me if you have a question, and that my address is the numeral 7. Mr. Bobby, M-R-B-O-B-B-Y, at gmail.com. I would ask that you not write a long letter, as some of you still do. You know I can't read that over the air. Please do not do that. Make that concise and to the point so that I may read it to Mr. Fuller and he can understand it, and he will answer that question for you. Even if the answer is, I don't know, he will say that. So don't be alarmed or whatever, because that's part of it. If you know something, okay. If you don't, then he won't he won't answer. I mean, he will just say, I don't know. So don't be alarmed or be afraid. Okay, now, you can also, lastly, join the chat room, and that is at blogtalkradio.com. When you get that, then you want to click on where it says Programs. And the program you want is the Produce Justice Show, so you click on that. And when you do, the chat room becomes available, and you click on, and you're in the chat room. And many people get in the chat room, and and it's very, very educational in there. Now, listen, when you get in there, please, ma'am, please, sir, do not ask me a question to ask Mr. Fuller, because that's not what the chat is for. Occasionally, though, I will lift a comment or something out of it and 
perhaps for my own question to ask Mr. Fuller about something that may be hot, a hot topic in the chat room. Okay, I think that's it on that. All the books are in, and you will hear this all during the program. You can get everything that we, uh, Mr. Fuller talks about at ProduceJustice.com. ProduceJustice.com. One more time, ProduceJustice.com. All the information is up there, and you can go from there. Okay. Now, one more thing, very important. I've been in conversations um, since we last spoke, and there's a lot of people. Now, some of you are regular, like you, Cleo. We know you're regular, so you understand. But there's a lot of people that tune into the program that really do not understand what Mr. Fuller is talking about yet. Give them time. It takes time for most people including myself, it took some time to understand to grasp what Mr. Fuller was talking about. It's not easy. But when you get it, when the light comes on in your head, you understand what's going on. So there are people that are going to call in or going to say things that they may not have a clear understanding. But that's why you get the book. It's a tool to to guide you. I'm taking just a little bit of time because there are people – that told me that they're going to uh, listen in to today's program, particularly in the Dallas, Texas area. Uh, my daughter, one of my daughters, is going to be listening in on today's uh, program, and I'm hoping that she gets it, but I understand even I didn't get it at first, what Mr. Fuller was talking about. So be patient with them. All righty. All right. With that being said, let's get on with today's show. Okay, let me introduce to some and present to others Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. Mr. Fuller, good morning, and how are you? Good morning. I'm still learning. All righty. Sounding good, sounding clear. Okay, now we have this part here of the program. It's called The Thoughts and Expressions on the Mind of Neely Fuller, Jr. Mr. Fuller, today being the 5th of December, 2023, what is on your mind that you would like to share with us? Well, no. I just want to point out one thing that I haven't been focused on it, uh, but I've been checking on it constantly. And since it seems to be, it takes up a lot of TV time, radio time, Internet time is this thing called the Middle East, and it's really what's going on there has the potential of being explosive in one degree or another all over the world, and at least it's affecting. Everything that people are doing, directly and indirectly. Uh, first, it was this this year. The focus was Russia and uh, the problems that they are accused of being uh, of causing, and uh, so that was the early focus, and then here in the latter part of the year, uh, you have both of them. Uh, The so-called Middle East situation is uh, considered to be more explosive and in a direct or indirect way going to affect everybody, including people who say, I'm not interested in the Middle East thing. But then someone will say, well, you're interested in gas prices, aren't you? Say, yeah, I mean, you know, and I thought they were coming down, and they are. They say, well, that might not be starting off next year. You better start making plans. And so that's that's where my thing has been. I'm thinking about a, the practical stuff, the everyday stuff that affects all of us. Uh, rather than get into it about 
the details of who should be punished in Palestine, who should be punished in Israel, and going back and forth and back and forth and watching every detail of that, just say, well, for one thing, this, this has been my answer to what they call the Middle East, going way back to the 1950s. And I say the white supremacists has set up something called the Middle East. And it's supposed to be a testing ground for every type of chaos you can name. And that's what it's all set up to do. Endlessly. A testing ground, just like a rifle range. I mean, and whoever happens to be in that area can look forward to that forever. The way the white supremacists have it set up, regardless of the intentions of the people who are there, and the people who are not there. And so I came to that conclusion in my early 20s. I said, people keep talking about this Middle East situation. And, uh, and they're talking about uh, a guy named NASA. And who is he? And, whatnot. and so in talking to a few people, just a few, I came to that conclusion. In about 1957, 58, something like that. That's quite a while ago. And every time I've looked at the Middle East, that's all I'm getting out of it. I'm talking about this. People will say all about it being so holy. And this is, oh, you're talking about where Jesus walked. You're talking about Jerusalem and places like that. That's the holy land. And, we're looking forward to it on a thing now called Christmas. And, yeah, saying even back then, you had jet planes. I think an artist, a cartoonist called Herblock had a cartoon called, I think if I remember it, it was about something that indicated Christmas. It said, Oh, Holy Night. That was, I think that was what was on the top of the cartoon. I uh, should have saved that cartoon because it's perpetual. And, oh, uh, it was Silent Night, Holy Night, something like that. One of the standard slogans for Christmas and the birth of Jesus. O Holy Night, or Silent Night, that's the name of a song. And I think this cartoon had just a couple of words on it, Silent Night, or something like that. And then on the cartoon, it showed jet planes, fine rockets. <laughs> so much for O Holy Night, or Silent Night. Nothing solid about that, and nothing holy about it either, for sure. And so without even looking into the details of who did this and who did that and what hospital got bombed, just say, hey, that was set up to be a shooting gallery. And anybody who was there can look forward to it forever. Because as long as the white supremacists are in business, that's what it's going to be. Look how long it has been. So now, coming down to people like Neely Fuller, who is just a bystander at this point, looking on what black people should be doing is just looking at everything that they possess, start taking care of just the basic everyday business and be serious about it. Be serious about every move that you make from now on. Because you don't know when the gas is going to get cut off. I mean, this all of a sudden, I mean, you if you own a house and whatnot, you say the gas company doesn't seem to be much, you know, the house is cold. Well, I'm paying some pretty stiff money. And so when you call them, they'll say, yes, I, you know, 
Have you been keeping up with it? We're, we're working on it. We're trying to get it straight. But we've had to ration the gas. And so you might have to put up with, with some inconveniences, I mean, for the next three months. Now it's December. It's January, February, March. And you say, well, you might have to walk around in the house with just about everything you can put on. So you make sure you got plenty of blankets, because that could happen. But don't overload. Don't buy it. And for one thing, I know it's the holidays coming up, and I don't speak out against that. You, but I always say, spend, but spend very wisely. And don't give nobody nothing that they can't use right away. And don't try to send out no hints about receiving what you call luxuries. Forget that. Everything that you receive from somebody, even just normally, is something you can use immediately or somewhere in the foreseeable future. That's that's just the main message I want to get out this morning is that mm -hmm. do some belt tightening. And, you know, I know it's, I'm trying to sell people a book, but, and I want, still want them to buy the book because it'll help them with a, a lot of other, that and a lot of other things, I hope. But the basic message is, Every move that you make, not just financially, but every move that you make just making cell phone calls, every last one of those cell phone calls should be connected with producing constructive results. Mm -hmm. Every time you close the conversation, say, well, that's all i got to say for right now. I don't care who you're talking to. You should think back, what did I say while I was talking? And everything that you said and everything that was said to you, and you can do this from now on because I want to emphasize this, all this abstract conversation, I hear it all the time, and I know everybody else does too because it's loud talking for most black people passing them on the sidewalk and whatnot. I mean, just a lot of random talk and hostile talk, a huge amount of it. Just make a vow now. You're not doing, you're not getting engaged in any arguments with anybody, period. You don't have time for that. You don't have the energy. No arguments. Conversation. Have it well thought out before you make any kind of call. And when the other person picks up the phone and what not, what not, what not, the house phone, the cell phone, whatever, everybody that you can communicate with, white, non-white, male, female, uh, so-called friends, real friends, bosses, everybody that you say in anything to, Make sure it produces a constructive result the best you can before you even begin to talk. Don't, don't make quick talk. Call somebody right quick and then start thinking of something to say or how to say it. No, think it all out, including just about how long you will talk. And always, just make that a vow. From now on, starting with the end of this year, you're not going to be talking to anybody about anything except something that produces a constructive result for you and the people that you're talking to. Not ever again in life. And that's the basic thing that I wanted to say this morning. 
Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Fuller. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> okay, uh, 516-453-9921 is the number you call to get in contact with today's show. And the person who just called me, if you are listening and you're calling from a restricted line, do not, um, if you don't put your name in there, I'm I'm not going to answer that phone call. Okay, yeah, give me your name. Okay. All righty. Now, thank you again, Mr. Fuller. Now, uh, for those of you who already know, uh, white supremacy is a business. You have to look at it that way. Well, you don't have to, but... That's what it is. It's a business, and if you listen to Mr. Fuller, um, you know he has described that in many, many ways. It's a business. It's business. Business. You got to keep that in mind. Uh, I, I say that because, as you many of you know, Mr. Fuller and myself, we do not rehearse this program. It is completely off the cuff. That's why, at the end of the program, you know, I do apologize for myself in particular, because mistakes are going to be made, but it's raw, it's real. It, you know, I don't call Mr. Fuller, and he doesn't call me and say, well, we're going to say this, and we're going to say that. No, we just let it fly the way it is, mistakes and all. And then we go on from there. That's one reason, well, another reason why we ask you for, you know, forgive us for that. Okay, with that being said, Mr. Fuller addressed um, or mentioned the word set up. In, 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 in regards to the Middle East And uh, he is uh, absolutely right As far as I'm concerned And uh, I can back up Mr. Fuller's uh, statement Not that Mr. Fuller ever needs any backup from me Or anybody else for that matter And I did try to and have shared that with a few people But one of the things If you would care to uh, enlighten yourself with knowledge, especially since Mr. Fuller mentioned that it is a setup. Here's something for you to check out, and I've mentioned this before, and I'll do it again. It's called the Balfour Declaration. It talks, it speaks, or addresses the so-called Middle East. That's Balfour, B-A-L-F-O-U-R, Balfour Declaration. Uh, it'll give you an insight as to what's going on. Uh, you can either agree or not agree, but like I said, Mr. Fuller and I have not discussed this or anything like that, but it just backs up what he said. I've done some research on this, and I have mentioned it on this program. The second thing that you could look at is the um, for your consideration, again, being in mind that it's a setup and it's business, is the Ben-Gurion Canal Project, which is not mentioned in the in the public media, national media, anything, but it is real. I checked that out. Ben Gurion, B E N G U R I O N Canal Project. If you look at that and read it, and it'll give you an enlightenment as to what Mr. Neely Fuller addressed this morning concerning the Middle East. Now you can agree or not agree. You you know you don't have to. But these are things that are, like I said, since Mr. Full and I do not discuss whatever we're going to talk about, whatever the subjects are, this was right on point. So if you'd like to delve into that, you can and see. You can agree or disagree. And then the third thing, which he mentioned, somebody sent me a cartoon, a cartoon that is a uh, Produced by YouTube I didn't look at it, didn't read it But it's about the message that Mr. Fuller is getting out um, I forgot, I don't have it in front of me at this site But again, since Mr. Fuller and I do not discuss the program It was already mentioned It was already mentioned in what they're trying to do And what they do not want out And we know who they are which are they are the usual suspects. Now, you can check it out for yourself and see. You don't have to accept it or not. But anyway, those were some points that you may want to do. The Bell Far, the Bell Ford Declaration and the Ben-Gurion Canal Project. Check those out for your information 
and um, it'll help bring some clarity to your thoughts. Okay, 516-453-9921. Don't forget, if you call, don't forget to give the call screener your name so I can give you on there. And straight off the bat, itching to get into it, is Cleo from Houston. Get ready, Cleo. Here we go. Let me get you over here. Okay, Cleo. Okay, there you go. Cleo, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Long live NFJ and forever live logic. Uh, my sincere appreciation, as always, to Mr. Bobby, Robert, Sharon, Moonpie, the entire CRCS crew, for your ongoing partnership with Mr. Fuller in this very important life work. Mr. Fuller has often uh, shared that in the global power system construct of racism, white supremacy, there is absolutely nothing to celebrate. I agree with him uh, with regards to that. And in, in my agreeing with him, I have developed a speech code based upon the content shared in Mr. Fuller's book whenever I'm going through these so-called celebration seasons called holidays, which Mr. Fuller recently referred to as uh, supposedly holy days, um, I'm greeted with uh, greetings of happy holidays, happy Merry Christmas, uh, happy Thanksgiving. And my reply, and I share this as a VGQ, Mr. Bobby, for the listening audience, uh, is simply happy whole days. And I, that is to garner constructive conversations in which they usually ask or will ask, um, what do you mean by that? And then I can go into what Mr. Fuller has shared about whole days. And then I also do that for birthday. Um, and I, instead of saying happy birthday, either through Facebook or any social media form to my friends, my family, uh, associates, affiliates, co- coworkers, colleagues, it's simply happy breath day. Mm-hmm. Every breath of every moment is a gift. Use it to solve problems and produce justice. Mr. Bobby, having said that, I want Mr. Fuller, if he would, please, explain to the listening audience what is uh, meant by uh, uh, breath, how we should look at every breath as a gift, and also how we should look at holidays as a whole day to engage in constructive rather than non-constructive results. All righty. Thank you, you, Cleo. All righty. Mr. Fuller. Go ahead. Uh, when people say happy birthday, and the last one I just had, I always think about it naturally because what they call my birthday is just a reminder that that's what's in the code book. I put it in there years ago because that sounds logical to me, and that is, I am not born every every year. I was born one time. Now, when I was uh, closely associated with the Christian church, and uh, I didn't abandon it, uh, nothing like that. I just gained more knowledge from other religions, and I combined it all. And that's why I call myself an eclectic pluralist. Uh, when people ask me about the name of my religion, but that's another story. But under, uh, you know, since your birthday, it's usually associated almost like a religious day. Religion means uh, a strong belief backed up by action. So if I have a strong belief backed up by action, uh, I, logically speaking, I'd better make sure that my belief and my action based on my belief should be of constructive value, and that's always imperative. What's, what's the value of it? And it should be based on truth. Because anything not based on truth is absolutely way over the top something that should not happen in anything 
in what I call compensatory logic or code for a person. So, I have a breath day every day. From the time I inhale for the first time until, and that will be coming up, I always say a little too soon <laughs> for people like me, for sure. Pretty soon, just from bodies wearing out. I have a body. It's going to wear out. I already know that. I see that every day. I've seen it ever since I've been here. I mean, uh, just by knee high to a duck. Okay? So when I inhaled that first time, that was my birthday. I have not had a birthday since then. I have breath days. I've been breathing ever since. Now, either that's true or false, but I say that that's true. I didn't go back into the womb every morning. And then one year old, I mean one day old, one hour old. No. I had one birthday. And that was the first time I breathed. So that was also a breath day. But I have not had a birthday ever since. And they have a slogan called Born Again, but that's that's a philosophy that mm-hmm. deals with something on the side. But stop and think about it. You're not born every so-called year. And even, you know, you will say that that's your birthday. That's not your birthday everywhere on the planet. Think about that one. I mean, you know, you, you're a college student by now. You know, stop and think. Thinking, thinking, thinking. Okay? Or even in high school. Think about it. Uh, Were you born yesterday? The answer is no. But even when you say that you have a birthday, like October 6th, 1929 was my birthday, but that wasn't my birthday everywhere. On the other side, we have time zones. Last time I checked, and so when it was October 6th with me, it was October 7th somewhere else. Another day. So which one of them is true? Both of them. Or you taking a breath day, or if you want to call it a birthday. So you're born twice then, I guess. October the seventh in one part of the world, and October the sixth in another. I don't know exactly where the divide line is. There's somebody that knows when it's October 6th here in Washington, D.C. Uh, is it October the 6th in Egypt or in Manchuria? Yeah, I haven't broken the time zone down. But, and that's always been, ever since they have had that type of measure. Uh, using what they call the Christian calendar. All right. Among some tribes, I mean, they probably got a different calendar altogether. No such thing as October or August, December. They don't have anything like that in their tribe. They call it about so many moons, some some. Indigenous tribes will say that. So that takes care of that about the birthdays. 
No, they're breath days. You breathe, and then you have a lot of breathing days, hopefully. And then you have a thing called the death day. You have a breath day, just one, and then you have a death day. At death day, you stop doing what? You stop breathing. And that's the truth. Always go with the truth. One birthday, the day you're born, you inhale and exhale for the first time. And you do that, I don't know how many times you do it. I don't know if anybody knows the number of exact times over a year, of, a span of 50 years that a person breathes. So sometimes you catch your breath. So all you can do is come up with an average. But that last time that you inhale and exhale and you don't inhale again, that's your death day. Breath day, death day. One time only. Now, what's the second part of that? Okay, question? and the second one, what he said, uh, is very, and very quickly because we are up against time, a uh, holiday versus, uh, he now uh, calls it all, instead of saying holiday, oh, yes. he says whole day. Yes, every day is a whole day, and every day is a holy day, and every day is a holiday. And you should treat every day just like that. Every day is a whole day. And in a whole day, what are you supposed to be doing with the breath day that you and I and everybody I know about has been given? That's a super gift. So no person should say, I ain't never had nothing. Yeah, you did. You got it now. You're sitting there breathing. That's a gift. You're talking about waiting to get a gift. Man, you have had it all the time. Didn't even know it. So don't say that you never was given nothing. Mm-hmm. You're breathing. Just, just hold your breath for a little while and see how that feels. I do it every morning to remind myself I'm breathing. I got something to start with. I got something to do something with, and I'm going to do something with it. Because I'm supposed to be taking every one of those breaths and producing a constructive result. I owe that, according to my religion, to whatever gave me that first breath. I owe that. I didn't, do, I didn't make no effort to have something called breathing. I'm on automatic when I was asleep. I'm breathing. I don't have nothing to do with that. I'm not even aware of it. So that is a wonderful gift. Just inhaling and exhaling. And a lot of us just listen to the propaganda and mess that up with something called smoke. It took everybody, movie stars, everybody, so many of them. It's debonair, it's sophisticated. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Light up a cigarette. Mm -hmm. Smoke a pipe, that makes you look intellectual. Killing yourself. Why? You're cutting off that breath. That's what you inhale. They got a thing that was supposed to be just right for your lungs. Perfect for your lungs. It's called fresh air. Not some opioid. I hope I made the point. Okay. All righty. Got it. Uh, okay. 
All right, here, we're way over for a break, so let me take a quick break and get right into it. You're listening to the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr., and we thank you for your listenership. Call it in. You can call it in. Call it in at 516-453-9921. And then if you have something to say, make sure that you press the number one button. And because we're getting this short on time, I'm going to ask you today, please, today, 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 Please be quick so that Mr. Fuller can answer the question. As you know, and as you just saw, he takes his time in answering the question thoroughly so that it cuts down on confusion. So please, ma'am, please, uh, sir, keep that in mind. Make your um, request uh, short and sweet. Books can be obtained by going to ProduceJustice.com. ProduceJustice.com. That's where you get the books. Remember, he addressed the uh, middle, the so-called Middle East uh, situation today, and I did happen to find that uh, cartoon uh, that somebody had sent me that Mr. Fuller had no idea that somebody had done it. I'll hopefully get to that a little later. Okay, uh, let's go back to the phone lines and let's see here. Um, it says, uh, okay, I'm going to take a chance here. If I'm wrong, I'm going to be in trouble. Okay, uh, Rita, although it does say Aaron, but Rita, you're on with uh, Mr. Fuller. Go ahead with your question, please. Hi, can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Oh, wonderful. Mr. Fuller, just want to thank you so much for your work. Um, you have made an incredible change in my life, so we I appreciate you, and I appreciate your attention towards justice and your eye towards making sure that no one's mistreated and that people get help. My question for you is my son, who is very intelligent, currently attends an all-black school. While I appreciate the nurturing and familiar environment, I've observed several shortcomings in the educational approach. Additionally, data indicates systemic challenges in many black school districts. I've been presented with an opportunity to enroll him in an elite private school that's willing to offer financial assistance upwards of $30,000 per year. However, this would mean that he's one of very few black students. In contemplating this decision, I'm mindful of your teachings about codification and the potential challenges of being showcased Considering the financial support offered, could this be could this opportunity be seen as a form of reparation? Also, how can I assure that my son remains codified in this new environment and resists being placed in a showcase position? Now, yes, the question is, how can you? The first question is, considering the financial support that this school is offering, could that be seen as a form of reparation? Considering what the school is offering? Yes, they're offering to pay us. What what is the school offering? In other words, what's the problem? The school is a private school, and they are financially... Okay, the school is a private school, and what's the problem? They charge $35,000 a year, and they're willing to to give us $30,000 a year to send him there. But so, it's an all-white school, and he would be so, one of the only black students there. So what do you want? It comes down to wants. What do you want from the school? And that's the whole purpose for going to school. You want something from the school, I guess, that's worth the money that's being asked for. And so... What do you want the school to do? Because I guess well, that's I, who you're asking. Right. I want the school to help him be constructive and to be a problem solver. Mm-hmm. So have you told them that? Yes. And these schools are... And they told you that what? That you would have to have a certain amount of money? And see, well, I'm trying to get to the core of the problem. So Evidently the question there is, is a problem. <laughs> yes, the question is that he is currently being educated in an all-black school right now. And I do see advantages to having students be educated in an all-black environment. There's a familiarity there, and there's nurturing there. 
and there's a commonality where he sees people who look like him, and I think that is important. However, I also know that in these schools, the education isn't, in my opinion, as strong as the schools in these other areas that he's being offered to go to. I would love to be able to send him there, but I'm worried about sending him there in an all-white environment and he lose who he is. And I'm curious as to how do I ensure that he does get a great education where he becomes a problem solver, but how do you prepare him to be one of the only black students in an entire building? Like, how do I keep him on, how does he stay on code when he has very few black influences if I send him to this school? He stays on code anywhere that he is on the planet. Okay. See, that's what the code is for. You, you're able to function. Because you understand everything that's going on around you wherever you are on the planet. And nobody has an understanding about what's going on more than you. That is the mm-hmm. essence of what I'm trying to do on this. Uh, that you don't put yourself in a kind of a box of any kind. Black people, mm-hmm. see this box thing, this box. I mean, we're, mm-hmm. you know, we're born in a thing called a ghetto. I mean, that's a box. We call mm-hmm. it the black community. I mean, heaven forbid. Don't, don't, don't put me in nothing like that. That's a box. Okay. You say, well, Fuller, don't you kind of want to relate to black people? All the way? You relate to everybody on the planet in five minutes without scratching your head about nothing. This is how you want to get when you enter any situation or leave any situation. Because every situation is about what's the best thing to do for everybody, whether other people are doing it or not. What's the very best thing to do? That's what I mean. Follow only one thing. Once you hit the surface of this planet called Earth, and this applies to everybody, not, well, we have to, uh, you know, teach our children. We need to teach ourselves. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, we ain't got nothing to teach them. <laughs> uh, we need to tap into something that very few people tap into or want to tap into or even think about it. Just one thing that the Creator put here. Logic cause and effect fire will burn water is wet now basic things like that we understand that but when we go just a little bit beyond that we we get completely frustrated it's the same thing something either is constructive or not constructive you can teach him and just drain, drain that into his brain. Is this constructive? I mean, if he's around white people, non-white people, male, female, church, anybody's church, mosque, synagogue, on a job, if he gets a little bit frustrated about whatever he sees anybody doing, You know, he doesn't have to tiptoe and peep around the corner and see if they're black. Just walk right into the crowd. Now, what's going on here? That's the question. And if what is going on here, is it constructive or is it non-constructive? That's what you call relating to your environment. That's logical. Logic was put here to use. Either something is constructive or it is non-constructive. That's really all he's got to remember. I don't care where he is. Mm. At midnight, up under the 10,000 meters under the ground, like those people went down to look for the Titanic, you look at what you're in and look around and say, wait a minute, we're going to be pretty far down there. 
is it really guaranteed that this endeavor is constructive or non-constructive? I mean, we're going down this fancy machine. We're all millionaires or billionaires. It's this thing that we're in. Is this going to do the job or not? No guesswork. Is it going to do the constructive thing, which is take us on a tour for whatever reason we want to go, hoping that our reasons for wanting to go are constructive or not? Hmm. And if you can hmm. afford to do it, and do it like you said, the school you're going to, uh, or he might go to, is it what they're going to give him when he goes in there going to be better than the best that he can do? And can you afford it? If you can't, take that into consideration and get that worked out. But as far as where he's going to do whatever he's going to do in his existence, the only thing you really have to make sure of, other than being able to not let that drive you in some type of bigger problem than you already had, that's that that's not supposed to happen. But just remember, teach him. You do this yourself. Everything is constructive or non-constructive. And if he's talking to white white people just around nothing but white people, you know. And they he hear the word nigger. Excuse me, using it on on this program, but the N word. I mean, I heard it all the time around every type of environment. Because, see, I did a lot of reading on the side, so I was prepared for a whole bunch of stuff when I started going to other parts of the world and all like that. I say, you know, I read about, I read about these things going on in Japan, you know, when on a summer day looking at National Geographic on a porch in the country, in Oklahoma. <laughs> All okay. right, so you can do a little bit of reading and a little bit of research, you know, before you get in an environment. Hmm. So I'm very, I'm not very surprised about anything that happens. That's another thing. Be hmm. ready for every surprise. All right, let's let's move it on here. Uh, we're very short for time, so read it very quickly. Very quickly, what is your second question so we can move on, please? Oh, no, that was it. Thank you so much, Mr. Fuller. Okay. All right. All right. And we've got to elaborate. Learning something without unlearning it real quick, which is what most of us tend to do, including me. Uh, repetition, you know, has its value. So for people who are waiting on the line, I just want to say this. Uh Sometimes when you when you hear something two or three times, it doesn't stick. But I have found out that repetition, that's why the Army does what it does. It has you do the same thing over and over and over again so much that you get so sick of it. I mean, you want to tell the world how sick you are of it. All righty. Um, everybody, please keep in mind that we are under a a time limit, so uh, I'm going to ask you if you would l please limit your questions, because even right now we're up against the clock. Hey, P, we're coming to you right now. You're on with Mr. Fuller. Wait a minute. Uh, okay, go ahead, AP. Hello, uh, Mr. Bobby and uh, Mr. Fuller, you all do a great job. I always tune into your program. I want to do. I do want to advise you as to what happened to me today in my attempts to try to get on the air, and this is at least the second or third time that you all have had difficulty, and it seems as though the usual suspects are messing with the airwaves. I could not get your programming on my phone, so it was a good thing that I had my uh, number to be able to get into the program, and so I'm actually listening to the program on my phone. Have you had those kind of problems today that you know of? As far as I know, uh, no, and uh, people who monitor the program on our side 
have not mentioned anything about that, but I don't know. Uh, something could be going on. But anyway, you're on, so we're glad okay. you're on. Mm-hmm. That goes to show that the usual suspects are definitely busy. I I, I um, wanted to kind of um, have Mr. Fuller, if he would please, explain to the listening audience, the public that's uh, listening to your program, to uh, explain in depth uh, the the refinement stages of racism, white supremacy, what it is and how it works. Um, especially in the area of politics and entertainment. And what I am hearing, which you made mention of the Belfort, um, um, you know, the Belfort Declaration and some of the other things, because in the news today there is a a lot more of that going on, and the deception is, is very deep because they are keeping us confused, and the deception is just on another level. Can you please, uh, Mr. Fuller, share with us your opinions about those things? Especially, I I missed what happened today in terms of of what you led in today because I was not able to get on the program. Okay, I'll uh, I'll repeat that after the the, uh, the phone call. But anyway, go ahead, Mr. Fuller. Thank you. The process, according to the code, always is the same, questions and answers. You want to eliminate deception? All you do is when somebody says something, if you don't understand everything that they are saying, you ask questions. Like what you're talking about right now, something has been mentioned over and over again. Balfour Declaration. I've heard that. I have never bothered to look it up. Uh, even to see what it says in the encyclopedia, which, you know, logically speaking, when you need information, you can sometimes go to an encyclopedia. Some of us don't even think about that. Or a dictionary. Most of us don't think about that. You know, you don't know what a word means, go to the dictionary. A dictionary, because there's a lot of dictionaries, and see what that says. And if you don't understand what you're looking at, then you under, then you ask questions about that. Because the formula, according to the code, every question, every problem, rather, in the known universe is solved through the process of questions and answers. And so who do you ask? You ask the person that knows. Well, who would know better than... I understand Mr. Balfour or somebody was a person and he made some kind of declaration on paper that people should pay attention to or Mr. Balfour says that they should, then you look at whatever the declaration declaration is. And anything you don't understand about it, just ask Mr. Balfour or someone who has been designated to speak like in a forum or in a political situation or whatever, in a classroom, what it is, what it ain't, and what it's supposed to do. And that's all you got to do is just listen for the answer and then check on it and see if that Balfour Declaration, and I got no idea what it is, but see if it does what it's supposed to do. And then if it's not doing what it's supposed to do, and if what it's, it's supposed to do is constructive, then ask questions about that. And then ask the major questions, how come it ain't worked? If it's supposed to solve something, because the people are shooting at each other anywhere. I mean, a black person uh, shooting somebody behind the counter at the corner grocery store. Oh, you ask questions about that. And the answer yeah. is, why is he doing that? Mm-hmm. And then you um, ask, get the other answers. Okay. Excuse me, Mr. Fuller. We have to break it just for a second uh, because yes, we are out of the first hour. 
Uh, yeah, we're going to break it in and we'll come right back in. Okay, thank you for all who were listening to the first hour of the Counter Racist Coach Show with Mr. Neely Fuller. And, uh, of course, you know, we made some mistakes, so forgive us for that. But we have an exciting second hour coming up, so stay tuned for the second hour. If you have to go, hopefully you'll have a good week and be back next week. But stay tuned for the second hour of the Counter Racist Coach Show with Mr. Neely Fuller coming up in five seconds. All righty, welcome back to the second hour of the Counter Racing Coaching with Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. I am your co-host, Mr. Bobby, and we would love for you to get in contact with the show, so welcome. I kind of messed that one up, but anyway, welcome to the program. This is the second hour, and to get in contact with the show, 516-453-9921 is the number. When you do that and you have a question or comment and please ma'am please sir we're asking since we are up against the clock to be brief so that Mr. Fuller can answer your question now you know that Mr. Fuller is going to use a lot of examples so there's going to be some time expended in it but that is because it is important that we get an understanding to eliminate confusion and please remember follow the rule don't ask a second question until the first question is answered please I do that all the books are in. You can go to ProduceJustice.com and get uh, the books and all that. In the first hour, Mr. Fuller addressed a little bit about the uh, uh, so-called Middle East. Now, those were my words, so-called Middle East. But he addressed that, what's been going on. Remember that he has mentioned that white supremacy is a business. If you are thinking about it, try to look at it from a business point of view. Oh, yes. Also, remember that there are those who listen to the program uh, who really do not understand what Mr. Fuller is talking about. It does take time for it to sink in. Give it time. And eventually, if you give it time, it will sink in. And that is why the books are available at ProduceJustice.com to help you. It's a guide to help you. You may not agree with everything in the book, and you don't have to, but glean what you can from that uh, from that book. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, and he mentioned that uh, the Middle East is a setup, and one of the things, and like I said before, Mr. Fuller and I do not rehearse this program. It's completely off the cuff, but I did add this, and he addressed it at the very end of the last hour, the Belfort Belfort Declaration. Uh, You need, or if you would like, uh, for understanding, understanding, of what's going on over there, that is one uh, declaration you might want to read, Belfour, uh, B-A-L-F-O-U-R, Belfour, a four declaration. You can check that out. And then uh, another one is the Ben-Gurion Canal Project. That's Ben and then Gurion, G-U-R-I-O-N, Canal Project. Uh, Check that out, and you will... um, uh, can make some observations as to what's going on. And as far as I know, that was going on back in the 60s, maybe in the 50s. But check that out and see if it adds to um, what's um, going on uh, concerning the Middle East. The last One of the last comments Mr. Fuller made, and I thought it was a good, he made three quick points when you're trying to find out something. He said, well, find out what it is. And this is a real important point, what it ain't. What it is and what it ain't. I think most of us have been taught to just ask one question, just one side. But he mentioned this, and I wrote it down. A, what it, whatever it is, what is it, and then what it's not, and then this is real important. You need to find out what it is supposed to do. What it's supposed to do. I thought those were excellent points there, uh, uh, Mr. Fuller. Okay, so hopefully that took care of you uh, there, um, AP, uh, since you were having problems with your phone. Yes, and the usual suspects uh, have been um, doing some stuff. And I'm going to read this, and I'm going to go ahead on. Uh, This was concerning the cartoon that uh, Mr. Fuller briefly mentioned in the first hour. And I was sent a Gmail this morning. I wasn't – I didn't get a chance to read it, but – this is what this said. This is from Nathan, Mr. Fuller. He said this. He said that he sent a post to friends all around the world with a group of cartoons about 
an hour long of some of your, Mr. Fuller, most powerful teachings. He says, I don't know and don't you know that uh, he says that YouTube has removed it after only one day. Now, I don't know what that means. I haven't vetted it. I haven't checked it out, but I thought I would do that. Uh, I do know this, that a lot of things um, that uh, you talk about or that we discuss on this program, there seems to be more interference than what you usually have, and uh, it could be that the usual suspects are up to something. But this is what I do know, that when you tell the truth, somebody don't like it, and they have are very skilled, particularly since this is a business, at uh, letting stuff go through or not go through because they don't want you to know. You can relate that to critical race theory if you would like, but they don't want you to know. They don't like it that you and Mr. Fuller have put this stuff in the book so people can read it. So if they can sabotage it, and I'm not accusing them of, but I'm just saying the seeds are planted so that we do not know what the truth is. Okay, moving on with the program. Let's go to Long Beach. I don't know if it's California or not, but it says here it's Stephen. Stephen, here we go. Right here, let's see. All right, Stephen, you're on with Mr. Fuller, second hour. What is your question for Mr. Fuller? Yes, I was calling in about um, something I asked him last year about an alien interview. He said he didn't um, have any time for it and. Um, it was a nice thing. I wanted him to check out a lot of the scientific evaluations that went on with the Q and A in the file, but it was fine. Um, my question was that he said one time that the black criminal wanted the ultimate power in the system of white supremacy. What is the ultimate power in the system, and what construct the route where he suggest to get to the ultimate power for those who are interested in it? Mr. Fuller. The question is what? The black criminal, you said a the while black back, criminal, wanted the, the black, ultimate power. The black criminal, what? What wanted about the black the, criminal? He, You said one time, you said they wanted the ultimate power. The black criminal wants the ultimate power. Yes. Is that what you're and, saying? Um, yes, but the question was, what is the ultimate power and what constructive route would you suggest to um, get to the ultimate power for those who wanted the ultimate power? Hey, hey Stephen, you've you got to ask him one question at a time. You can't put them okay. together. Okay. Yeah, the, the black criminal. What black criminal? The black person that commits crimes. Wants what? The ultimate I'm trying count. to get the subject matter. What is, what is this question about? Is it about a black criminal, or is it yeah. about? Well, it's it's yes. You said they wanted the ultimate power, and I wanted to know what is the ultimate power. That's the well, question I, right now. Well, ultimate power means you got ultimate power. You're God. How about that? <laughs> That's the ultimate power. And so what would are be, you saying that the black criminal wants to be God? I mean, is God real in your valuation of how religion goes? <sighs> and who is God? Is the white supremacist like the white supremacists in general are the ultimate power? Just naturally, or do they have a way to have their ultimate power? Well, the white supremacists believe that they're going to have and should have and and do have ultimate power on earth over non-white people while they're here, both white people and non-white people. And they want the power to mistreat. non-white people at will and nobody's able to stop it 
and they want the power to help you or not. And they got it. Now, what black people who are criminals, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what context to put that in other than what they are for sure subject to the white supremacists. You don't have any black people who are more powerful than the white supremacists. Not any. Not one. Not on this planet. Maybe on some yeah. other, but not. And if there are some, I have been, I have not been informed. Or if there's one or two, whether it's a he or a she, or some type of conglomerate, it hasn't been brought to my attention. Just one black person he can, who can overrule the white supremacists. The white supremacists speak and say, that's it. I don't want to hear no more. No more back talk. This discussion is over. When the white supremacists say that on this planet called Earth, all the black people start filing out of the room. Because for all practical purposes, their God has spoken. Okay. There, I mean, and even people like Neely Fuller with his textbook. I just fold it up and head for the exit. Because the people that tell me what to do and I better do it are white. Not all white people, but what they, what other white people say are the most powerful. Then the question is, are they white supremacists? And the answer is yes. If they believe in doing two things, dominating and mistreating people who have color in their skin. That's what makes you a white supremacist. You're not a white supremacist just for, because you're white. You're a white supremacist because you have that kind of power and can prove it in less than two seconds or maybe one second or just prove it in no second. It's done. Dominate and mistreat. Do you have that kind of power? And nobody can do anything but make a lot of noise, screaming and yelling and cussing and stomping as they go out the room. And you can't even do that if they say, you better stop that. Because they can stop you with a bullet. And that's the end of that story. Hmm. All righty. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Steve. Stephen from... Um from uh, Long Beach. Uh, let's see here. Wait a minute. Okay. Um, hmm. Uh, AP, let's see here. Wait a minute. Let's see if I can do this. Um, I did answer your first question since you had a problem with your phone, uh, and I did address it, and Mr. F- Mr. Fuller addressed it also. But I'm going to get you back in so you can uh, complete that. Um, go Thank ahead, you. AP. Oh, I'm I'm back on? Go ahead, AP. I wanted to ask, Mr. Fuller, uh, the reason why I, I asked the question is because uh, as I follow the news, especially uh, in the area of politics, uh, entertainment, and mainstream, uh, mainstream media, it's very apparent that Mr. Fuller, when you speak about uh, asking questions, one thing that I find very, very shrewd in what white supremacists usually do is they never answer your question, one. Two, they're very deceptive when they do answer the question. They know how to uh, fall away from the question. They're very good at making the victim look like the perpetrator and the perpetrator look like the victim, Uh, especially with what you see in the war in Humas. We don't control any media. And I, as a, as a, as a, uh, you know, a non-white person, uh, have a problem with listening to white America that seems to be angry, mad, don't want to give black people, don't want to produce justice. They don't want to leave us alone. 
and they don't want to give us our media, so we can't. Uh, the questions and answers are evaded, and you can never get to the truth of how they really feel sometimes. And they won't tell you how they feel, and they won't allow you to have a medium. That's why Bill Cosby had a problem. And I, I, I just have a problem with how are you going to ask questions to someone like the white supremacists who have the power that you just speak of, and they have no they have no uh, incentive in their mind to relinquish everything that they seem to have. Don't want to have. Don't want other people to have anything. Um, and we have this this fundamental problem. Uh, how are you going to get any help from them? How are you going to ask for what you need if they find evasive ways of getting away from it? And then they don't feel that they have to answer to anybody that questions them on it. Okay. That's my statement. That's my question. All righty. Thank you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. you. You handle that just like you're saying it right now to yourself first. They're not going to answer my questions, but I'm going to ask. Yes. And I'm going to keep asking. Yes. See, that's how you do it. That's called the compensatory code. Compensatory means you make up for what's missing. What's missing is the answer to your question. That's what's missing. And they can talk for 15 days, which they will. They don't mind it. They don't care how long it takes. That's good practice for them. Mm-hmm. But when but when they stop talking, like it says in the code book, you say, Sir, can you explain or give me the answer to a question in a way that I can understand what you have said? And you can say, of course, I say it, and will say it anywhere in the world and say it all day with ease. I am not a very intelligent person, sir. Ma'am. Got no problem with telling the world that. What I call being very intelligent is you know how to solve every problem that everybody, anybody ever had. That's what I call intelligence, according to the code. Making up what's missing. Mm-hmm. Anytime you get sick, you don't go to no doctor. You are the doctor. You tell everybody in the world what to do about everything. That's what I call an educated person. If you can't do that, you ain't educated. Because you can't do what needs to be done. It's the time it needs to be done. Okay? But that's to myself. That's the compensatory code. So that's out of the way right from the jump. So you just tell the person. He said, well, sir, the white person, give this as an example. Oh, well, buddy, I I did the best that I could. I, I took you to my, I took you aside and spent a week explaining it all to you. And I, I did it. And uh, you still don't understand what I told you? And you say... I mean, as an example, Neely Fuller would say, well, I told you, sir, that I am not a very intelligent person. And when everybody else catches on real easily and laughs at me, the laughs are on me because I am not a very intelligent person. You have to go over it with me maybe a third time and a twelfth time. But if you don't have time and uh, you don't have the patience to do that with me, then I have another question. Where can I get the information that I need to get, sir, that I'm trying to get from you? See, everything takes care of itself if you think scientifically. And all the drama... Black people need to throw that out the window all together. We don't need no drama. We got drama. We know about drama. We know about waving our arms and cursing and all like that. Enough of that. Just ask questions, get answers from somebody who has them, and solve problems. 
that's what it's all about. Not trying to impress somebody about who you know and where you where you go and all like that. You got a problem? Get this problem solved. That's an old army expression. Get it done. All that other stuff don't matter. Well, you know, uh, you know, I uh, I don't think he likes me. And I, my goodness, stop it! Stop that! Stop that! If the person tells you I don't like you, but I'm gonna give you the answer that you're listening for, and I'm gonna solve your problem. Well, now, you can. Now, which one you want to deal with? Whether or not I like you, or whether or not I can solve your problem. Boom! In the codified logic book, that second part is the only part that you heard. <laughs> hmm. I don't oh. like you. You don't think about that for two seconds. Hey, I can fix your problem in the next five minutes. Hmm. Now, you can either do that or you're going to be in pain for the next five years. Take your choice. You've got two Two minutes to make up your mind. Now, with a whole lot of black people, yeah, but you said you didn't like me. <laughs> Codification has got getting right to the point. Solve the problem or not. Yeah. And move on exactly. to the next. Yeah. Yeah. See that? Exactly. That's what, see, we got to we got to learn to do that. Have that yeah. see minute. That is an education. I mean. Uh, be able to focus on what matters and what doesn't. Yeah. Hey, who cares if somebody likes you or not? <laughs> Remember, this not is only business. don't like you, I ain't going to never like you. <laughs> you understand that? <laughs> but I'm going right. to tell you what to do to solve <laughs> your problem in the next two minutes, and you will always know this is how to solve it. I will say, man, you're the best. You're one of the best people I ever ran into. Mm-hmm. Well, <laughs> if not I the best, yeah. problem solver. <laughs> yeah, I didn't see. I didn't see that in business class, but it's business <laughs> anyway. Uh, mm-hmm. Let's. Uh oh, here we go. Uh oh, get ready worldwide. Here he is from the yo. Uh huh. He's probably got a smile on his face now. Man, you have really got some pub. They blowing up my phone on you, Tariq. Youngstown, the yo. What you got for us today, man? Go ahead. <laughs> Top of the morning, Mr. Bobby, Mr. Fuller. Hope yes, everybody's sir. health as well. Yes, sir. Okay, I want to say a couple things real quick before I actually ask the question. I want, I'm going to make it quick, though, Mr. Fuller. Please. First yes, of sir. all, for any anybody that's living on this planet like me, I see things through a totally different lens than everybody I know. If the weatherman is telling me it's sunshine, I'm looking for snow in the backyard. Okay. you got to understand that this system is, is nothing but one big Ponzi scheme. The, peop- the people that you vote for is nothing. The, the stuff you see on TV, and, and you know like I do, Mr. Bobby and Mr. Fuller, the people that's actually really pushing the buttons, you never see their face, but, they put, oh. but they're controlling the world. Now, okay. now, real quick, people, now this stuff is going on in Israel and the Gaza Strip. You need to study the Rothschilds. The Rothschilds had a whole lot to do with that. So if you don't know what's going on over there and who's really pushing those buttons, you need to go back and read who the Rothschilds and some of those families are that's controlling the world. Now, that being said, Mr. Fuller, I know you said, according to code, all problems are solved by the process of question and answer. Now, let me ask you this. Now, when I was going through school, I had one of my real good teachers here in the Yo. She would always say, the only stupid question you ask is the one you don't ask. Now, Mr. Fuller, let me ask you something. If you're doing something that's obvious, say hypothetically you at home, somebody rides down the street and sees your door open, calls your house phone and you answer, oh, Fuller, you home? Or if you out in the yard, Physically cutting your grass, somebody walks up to you, Fuller, what you doing? Or if you outside washing your car, hey, man, you washing your car? Now, I got a brother that would say, what the F does it look like I'm doing? Now, Mr. Fuller, how do you handle that? 
you look at what what was saying, uh, and you concentrate. If a question is being asked, you concentrate. <laughs> and Fuller has a problem with this. You just concentrate, according to the code, on the question and politely answer the question. Yes. Even if there's something. Now, what was that? You, what you was physic- that? What you was that physically question? cutting your gra- you physically cutting your grass, your buddy. Yes. Hey, what you you cutting your grass, Fuller? Or are you at home? Somebody calls your house phone. Mm-hmm. You answer mm-hmm. the phone. Fuller, mm-hmm. you home? Now you want to say, dummy, what you think I'm doing? But now, how do you 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 shouldn't that be well, obvious that to a person? Says, what do you think? Okay, the question is. What do you think I'm doing? That was the answer uh, to after you asked that first question, the response was in the form of a question. Is that correct? What do you think I'm doing? See, codification is about slowing everything down and taking everything apart that's being said, Mm -hmm. word by word, no matter how long it takes. Because that's how you solve problems. That's just the only yeah. route. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so, so, what was that illustration on the response? Uh, what do you think I'm doing? That was a question. Hello. Well, I was just yeah, saying, yeah, go ahead. I was just, I was just saying because I know it's happened to you, Mister Bobby. I was just saying, if you're doing something obvious. Do you even need to justify with it? Like I said, I'm going to say again, you're physically cutting your yard. Your neighbor, Fuller, you cutting your grass? Now, you shouldn't even have to answer that question because he sees exactly what you're doing. Hold it hold it right there. The person asks, the person, this is, this is solid code. This is solid code. The person asks me a question. Is that correct? Yes, but he can see Every, what you're doing okay, in the front of code, him. The co- hey, the code says every question has an answer. According to the code, if you know the answer to the question, give the answer to the question. If you choose to answer the question, and there's no reason why you should not choose, if somebody asks me that, Ask me that question. Can't you see MF that I'm wow. washing my car? Um, and I would <clears throat> say yes. That's the answer to the question. Yeah. I I can see. See, I'm concentrating not on on, on on all the theater. See, black people got to get out of that mm-hmm. being on the stage thing. Mm-hmm. On the stage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you don't have to be on no stage all the time. Exactly. I mean, relax. Exactly. And, um, Terry, uh, since you did interject me in here uh, in, into the soliloquy that you had mentioned, I think that's the right word. Listen, under the code and under the teaching that I have learned from Mr. Fuller, I've learned that using your scenarios, you I remember that, that this is a business. That is the perspective that we're in. It is a business, 24-7, 365. So if, they, and if and when they would ask that particular question or those sets of questions, since you understand that this is a business, this is what I've learned from the code, and Mr. Fuller has mentioned this many times. Just tell the truth. That's all you have to do. If you're cutting the grass, even if it looks like you are cutting the grass, you don't have to respond by saying, what does it look like I'm doing? Just answer the question, yes, I'm cutting the grass, or tell the truth. That's the one thing. And then the first thing that you started off with about um, what they uh, are are doing and, and, and hiding things, there's a tremendous book. It's not on Mr. Fuller's book list, but it's a book that I've read many times, and it's called The Unseen Hand by Ralph Upperman, where they control a lot of stuff, as you mentioned, and even that person or people, that family's name that you mentioned in the beginning, 
Yes, they they are mentioned even in those declarations that I had mentioned before earlier. They're all mentioned, and a lot of them are behind the scene that you can't see controlling a lot of stuff. There's a lot of information that is there, and you have to go through and look at that if you care to. But remember, and no matter what you do in your dealings, tell the truth. You'll be on the side of truth. Thank you, Tariq. From the yo, you're famous now. <laughs> Have a blessed day. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to go back to the phone lines. You are listening to the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. And we would so love for you to get in contact with this show. There are people on the, on the line, so you may have trouble getting in. But here's the number right here, 516 516- Four five three nine nine two one. Press the number one button if you um, want to have a a comment. Comments have been kind of long today, so please try to make them be brief, and so that Mr. Fuller can understand it. Because if he doesn't understand, you know he's going to ask you a question, and he's going to do it slowly so that he can get what you are saying and then answer appropriately. Please. Ma'am, please, sir, please do that. Okay. Um, you can also get into the chat room, and they're booming in there. You know what to do. Go to blogtalkradio.com, and then you want to get where it says programs. You click on that, get programs, and the program you want. Don't go any further. It is the Produce Justice Show. That's the one. Hit that bad boy. The chat is comes up. You hit the chat, and you are in there with all the people that are in there, and they be talking, and it be real. So make sure you get into that. And lastly, if you would like for me to read, oh, by the way, uh, please do not ask me in the chat room to read a question for you. That's what the number is for. Uh, and then, and then of course, then you can Gmail me at the numeral 7, Mr. Bobby, B-O-B-B-Y, at gmail.com. And uh, it will not be read today, although I did read one or two today. It will not be read today, but at a certain time it will be read, and then we can go on from uh, there. And then I will let you know when it uh, when your Gmail be read, so you can hear it and all the stuff that goes on to uh, with that. Okay, so many things going on and battling the suspects. Oh Lord, have mercy. Okay. Oh yes. Don't forget. The books, Mr. Fuller's book, at ProduceJustice.com. As a matter of fact, before we go into Mr. Fuller, since we have a lot of people online, could you briefly just speak about your book so that people know that there actually is a book? And for new callers uh, or new listeners, they'll know about the book. So could you br- briefly give a little thing about the book? Go to Produce Justice. That's Produce like a produce counter in a grocery store, produce justice, because that's what we're supposed to be producing according to logic. (laughs) Producejustice.com. You can write that down. If you've got a memory like me, hey, you better. ProduceJustice.com, and you will see how to order the volumes. I always say the same book. It's the same book, all of it. There's three of them there, three volumes. One of them is supposed to be obsolescent, not obsolete. Obsolete, obsolete means it's not good at no good for you uh, at all. Obsolescent, the 1984 edition. Uh, I want to point that out. And that's been updated, the 1984 edition, the 2016 edition of the textbook for victims of white supremacy. There's two other titles on there. The smallest, the one in the smallest print. You will see a textbook workbook for thought, for speech, for action. In other words, what's at 
think about how to say things that probably need to be said, in my opinion, that's Neely Fuller's opinion, how to best say it or not say it, how to speak about the racist of you being a victim, the best way to do it, and what actions to take, how to respond in a conversation, how to have the best of conversations and speaking, and then what to do and what not to do. Very important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lots of things you don't have to do or shouldn't mm -hmm. be doing. Okay? And you can get the volume by going to ProduceJustice.com. And I just want to add this. Uh, if you don't want to read the book all the way through, and it says so in the book, just get in the habit of just picking picking the book up. Just having it handy. Where every now and then you just pick it up. I have books of quotations that are like that. So you can use this book the same way. Just pick it up and turn to any page and read something and then see what you think about it as you're walking out the door. You're walking out the door and you just Two minutes before you walk out the door, I mean, you're waiting on somebody, just pick it up and turn to any page and read one paragraph and then think about what you read. And I find out that that works for me even though I wrote the book. I do it even <laughs> now. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of stuff that I've written that I've forgotten a long time ago. So just try doing that. And <laughs> you I find it useful, all right, because I started doing it with other books before I yes. started doing it with my mind, with, with my own, rather. Just a little note. Okay. ProduceJustice.com. All righty. That's where we get the book at. All right, very quickly, let's go to New York. And, Darnell, get ready, get ready. Short and sweet. Here we go. Let's see if I can get this over here. Okay, wait a minute. There we go. Darnell, you're on with Mr. Fuller. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Hello? Darnell? Darnell once. Darnell twice. Okay, Darnell. Uh, I tried to get to you, but okay, didn't get one there. Let's go to Christopher. Okay, Christopher in Richmond, get ready. Okay. Yay! There, wait a minute. There you go, Christopher. What is your good morning? What is your question for Mr. Fuller? Hey, um, Neely, I just wanted to know: is there a particular reason why you haven't done any more cows radio show interviews on cows? Yes, because I. Uh... All, all of my business now, like this program, is set up for uh, somebody, other, everybody, uh, well, I'll put it this way. <laughs> I'm coming in real silly now. My business, all my business, my personal business, is being handled by somebody else, and they said that's, they had to do this. That's what they kept telling me. I, I didn't even want to have my own program. I, I was on a program pretty solidly, and I wanted to stay on that program. Uh, the people that I work with, uh, I know they are very disappointed in me, the people who had it set up in the first place. And uh, several other shows, that I was doing, one out in San Francisco. I mean, and the person probably is saying, that Neely Fuller, he's a phony. I mean, he said he want to help black people, and black people are struggling. Sometimes they they got shows where they're willing to present his program and all like that. And I was all into it and with it. And then it just turned out that 
for all kinds of reasons, because I have so many things. Uh, I just don't sit and talk on the phone. I got so many things coming at me all the time and did, even when I had those shows. And it just finally, it just broke down a whole bunch of things, things that had nothing to do with my programs directly. Of course, everything about me has to do with one or the other with my programs. But I just want to, and I've been wanting to for years, uh, uh, the years that I've been doing what I'm doing now, uh, tell the world that all of this stuff happened so fast, so many things that once you might call took me out of the, you know, of the most advantageous situation. And if I didn't make these moves, I would have been in a much worse situation. I had no way of compensating. So what I'm doing now is a way to keep from going under. And, of course, a lot of people have detected that and took some of them, not most, not the people that I had been working with, but all kinds of other people that I don't know anything about are doing all kinds of things. So people are telling me that shouldn't be done. And, of course, if you ask me who I blame for that, it's the white supremacists. They know what I'm doing. They don't mention me. They'll mention everything and, and everything that I say, like using the term white supremacy. They weren't doing that. White people were not using that term all down through the years. But now, see, they study. The white supremacists study. They say, well, the way we'll hound this guy full of You'll die on the vine, and we'll take over what's left of his tattered message. I know what they got planned, and we'll have some people set up to take what's left of his tattered message. We will get next to them, pay them like they'll want to be paid, and they'll go for the money. And we'll turn his story and his message inside out, upside down, and then we'll have it right back where we want it. So mm -hmm. he's no problem at all with his old worn-out self. Oh, wow. <laughs> Look mm. forward to it, folks. And I was a long way of explaining my situation. Yes. But I'm becoming more and more helpless, and they know that. They, yeah. they know everything about racism and what, how people react to it. It ain't nothing that they don't know. Mm -hmm. You can't surprise them. You cannot <laughs> surprise them. I want everybody to understand that right now. You're going to be surprised if you think that you can surprise them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Fuller, thank you. Sir. Uh, on your book list, or excuse me, your book or movie list, um, uh, one of the movies that was discussed this week was this uh, movie. I guess it's a book called "The Legend of Nigger Charlie." In the movie, it starred uh, Fred Williamson. Have you ever heard of that or read the book uh, about the legend of Nigger Charlie and what he did? What, what, what I heard. Was I heard that. I've heard. I heard that title many years ago, but I've never read it. And haven't heard anybody mention it until just now. Yeah, well, I, I guess it was a, a book in the Civil War days that, uh, that uh, this uh, slave, nigger, uh, Charlie, rather, uh, went about working for the uh, Southern aristocrats, went and uh, captured uh, slaves that were uh, renegade. And um, uh, he raided the locations in the north in order to capture the renegade slaves for a colony of southern uh, aristocrats living in uh, Mexico. 
So I, that was that was mentioned. I remember hearing a little bit about that when I was uh, uh, in my younger days, I guess in my teens. But I thought maybe um, you may have heard of that, or I noticed that it wasn't on your uh, list of movies, um, your your movie list, which is extensive. Okay. All righty, let's go to uh, Milwaukee. Corey, get ready, Milwaukee. Corey, wait a minute. Okay, Corey, you're on with Mr. Fuller. What is your question? Uh, good morning, Mr. Bobby. Good morning, Mr. Fuller. Good morning, sir. Um, uh, Mr. Fuller, um, I'm encountering um, a lot of gossip and unconstructive conversation from members of my care units that I try to minimize contact with. Um, is it constructive for me to have a conversation with them about the code concerning gossip and non-constructive conversation? Should I have this conversation with them or should I just stick to the code myself and not mention it? Okay. Mr. Fuller? You don't ever mention anything to anybody that they don't want to talk about. That's code. Stick that in your mind right now. Talk to people about the things they want to talk about. Okay? In answer to your question, what you do, what you do is talk to people only about what the people that you're talking to want to talk about. But when you talk, you ask, what do you want me to do? Always go to the wants. People always want to do what they want to do. And if they want you to talk to them, that's a want. It's okay. What do you want me to do? I want to talk to you. Why do you want to talk to me? That's the second question. After you get the answer to the first one. Mm-hmm. Number three, how do you plan to talk to me? The person got a plan to talk to you about what they want to talk about, so they'll tell you. People will tell you what they when they want to talk to you, they'll let you know that they want to talk to you. Yes. All you do is just go with it. And then you ask the fourth question. After they talk about whatever they're talking about and you you answer the way that you answer, then you say, Now what do you expect the constructive result to be out of everything that I just talked to you about. Because there ain't no point in talking to nobody if the end result is not going to be constructive. That talk that never should have happened. So you always want to know that fourth, the answer to that fourth question. Hmm. After, you, hmm. after, you have answered, after you have answered number two and whatnot, why? Why do we need this conversation? See, always about something constructive. Now, the person might even ask, how come you always talking about being constructive? And you'll say, because that is what I do. That's the answer to the question. Mm-hmm. And I do it. And I do it because I find, and why do I do it? If that question is asked, because I find that that works best for everybody in a conversation rather than have a non-constructive conversation that produces non-constructive results and winds up making more problems than you had before you start talking. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Solve problems without making any. And you can tell them that. Get that expression in your mind. Solve problems, what you are about. Solving problems without making any. Without making any. Has anybody figured out how to do that? 
Anybody in the room of a thousand or a hundred or ten million? Do you know how to, every time you open your mouth, solve a problem without making any? Everybody <laughs> asks themselves that before mm -hmm. they ever say anything. One word. <laughs> okay. All right. And if you can, you do it. Right. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Thank you, uh, Corey from Milwaukee. Uh, just as a Gmail, Mr. Fuller, I'm going to try to piece it together so that you can answer it appropriately. This comes from Ms. Anonymous, Ms. Ms. Anonymous says this, Mr. Fuller, do you think tattoos are unnecessary for anyone to get? That's the first part. Okay, let's do that first. Mr. Fuller, do you think that tattoos are unnecessary for anyone to get? Well, we ask, we'll have to ask ourselves, and that's what I'm doing right now, because I ask myself that. I said one thing. I always start with, I start with the concept. Mm -hmm. Does a tattoo solve a problem? Is that the most constructive thing that a person can do when they look at their skin? It's saying, what I absolutely need is a tattoo. Then I looked at tattoos. It looks like some type of skin disease to me. Every last one I've ever seen. Hmm. Okay. That's what. I, that's that's how Neely Poe's mind works. Yeah. When well, I look has... at a tattoo, mm -hmm. including the ones and the people who are in tribes and all like that. Uh, they can talk to me about it, but I say I have never seen a tattoo of any kind that did not look like a skin disorder. And the more of them I saw, the more disordered their skin looked. Okay. It all oh. looks like diseases to me because when you come out of the womb, you don't have none of that. So what <laughs> is that all about? See, so mm -hmm. my next question is, what constructive purpose does it serve? Mm-hmm. Okay. See, you well, start asking quite... questions. So okay. I, I don't see where they serve any. Uh, all righty. They attract Ernest... people's attention. But I don't even okay. know why the attention is being attracted. All right. Um, her next question with that in line, which you just said, is, uh, do you, Mr. Fuller, do you think it's a, it's sort of like a suicide, suicidal marks to the person's body when they get them? I don't know. I don't know, and I won't pass judgment on it, but I know how to find out. If my, if, if, if my offspring comes in with one, I'll ask him, what's that? See, so ask questions. Mm-hmm. You know, is that what you wanted to do, get a tattoo? Why did you want to get a tattoo? See, those four questions always apply. Yes. How did you plan to get that tattoo? You must have had some kind of plan. And hmm. just sit back and listen. Okay. And then ask that fourth question. Now, son, what do you expect the constructive result to be of you getting that Mickey Mouse tattoo all over your chest. Hmm. Okay. And her third question is, um, it was this. Um, Mr. Fuller, however, I do remember that you said something about ta tattoos in the past. Do you remember what you said in 
what do you really think of tattoos? No. What did I say in the past? Well, that's what she was asking. She do. She does remember. Oh, that was something. the question. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't remember the answer that I gave now. I uh, gave uh, gave then, but that's the answer I gave now. Uh, if I, you know, what do I think? See, someone who has a tattoo, and somebody sees it, evidently you want them to think about something, or think about your tattoo. They, uh, what is, you know, the person who has a tattoo, the logical procedure is to say, why did you, why do you have that tattoo? Or why did you think of getting a tattoo in the first place? What's the purpose of a tattoo? And you just sit back, put a big question mark behind it, and just sit back and wait for an answer. Let the person okay. talk. Mm-hmm. You've got your question out there. And that's me, even today. I do not understand the reason for having anybody take some type of instrument and paint anything on me, ever. Hmm. Until I come to the place where I figure i got to have one of these. I mean, this is going to really put me over. It's going to put me on top. Mm-hmm. It's going to solve my problems. You know, I, I'm about problem solving. Now, how does this help me to solve a problem? Hmm. <laughs> One of the p- persons in the chat room mentioned just now that uh, they feel that tattoos are for branding animals is what the uh, said. Wow, brand new. Yeah, I heard all about that. It's called slavery. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Let me put my name on you. Hmm. Yeah, Brandy. Woo. Good now, point. Who are you and what are you? Yeah, who do you believe? Look at that to, huh? tattoo, you know. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, Mr. Fuller, we have three minutes to so guess what? You got though you got two of those three minutes. So we're gonna leave that to you. Go ahead, Mr. Fuller. Well, I know if this, it seems like the newer generation is saying, yeah, that generation before us, they seem to be all crazy about running out as fast as they can and get a real expensive tattoo. But I ain't getting one. Now, that's how it seems to me. That just kind of crossed my mind the other day for mm-hmm. a whole lot of people. You know, if, uh, the, a few months ago, I noticed... This summer, a whole lot of people were bearing a lot of skin, more than I've seen, particularly white people. They're showing a whole lot of skin uh, in, uh, because they're out jogging and all like that. So they're just wearing a lot of stuff that looks like swimming gear, a two-piece, a lot of white females. So I also noticed that I hadn't noticed that before. So I asked the question. And I said, oh, this is a new, new generation out here jogging. So that's why they were revealing a lot of flesh, and they were bleeding the flesh, because they don't have tattoos everywhere. It came to me. And that might not be the ex- explanation for it. But I'm saying, oh, you got a new generation white and black people who are not getting tattoos. That's a a, a generation that's almost fast without me noticing it. Mm-hmm. Of course, my mind is beginning to slow down so much. <laughs> I'm not noticing a whole bunch of things. Uh, I know what you mean. But well, that's, Mr. That's Fuller, guess what? Conclusion. We right. have yes, come sir. to the end of the program, so we have about 30 seconds so those 30 seconds will go to you. I know you're going to say, uh, well, anyway, producejustice.com. But the final word goes to you. Yes, what I'm going to say. Stay focused for one thing, on what has to be done, and do the things that have to be done each and every day. Uh, have priorities. Keep making lists, a to-do list. Get in the habit of doing that forever. 
uh, 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 make a to-do list and do everything that's on that list that is of constructive value. And then that's prepare good. as best you can for the disasters that's coming up for this okay. next five or six years. Because Alrighty. I believe they're coming. Got to leave it there. Thank you, everybody. Forgive us for our mistakes, and we'll hopefully see you uh, uh, next week. Everybody have a blessed week. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Thank you, everybody. So do have a good day. Com. Alle musea hebben roofkunst. Allemaal. En ze weten het ook. Hier, Hing en Schilderij, is de nieuwe podcast van NRC rond een controversiële nazi-roofkunstzaak. Een topstuk uit het Stedelijk Museum, ter waarde van 60 miljoen euro, is overhandigd aan de erfgenamen van een Joodse vluchteling. Maar hier is eigenlijk helemaal geen sprake van roofkunst. Maar is dat terecht? Een podcast over roofkunst, over nationaal schuldgevoel en de exorbitante prijsstijgingen op de kunstmarkt. Vanaf nu te beluisteren in alle podcast-apps. Je kan het misschien niet zien, maar je hebt het in je. Leefkracht. Je moet het aandacht geven. Mensens helpt je met kortere wachttijden als je zorg nodig hebt. Dankzij onze zorgadviseurs kregen Mensens klanten afgelopen jaar gemiddeld 12 weken eerder zorg. Ontdek de voordelen op mensens.nl. Mensens. Zorg voor leefkracht.